Did you understand what he sang? Moment by moment. Do you know how long a moment is? It's not a minute. It's a moment. And I got curious about that, and I looked it up. And I found out that if you take one second and cut it into a thousand parts, a moment is 56 of those parts. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. What a beautiful and comforting thought. I'd rather be here today at this hour than anywhere else I know of on earth. The only place I'd rather be would be in heaven. And since that hour has not yet come, I'd rather be here. For Jesus is here. And where Jesus is, tis heaven. What do you say? Are you glad to be here too if you are? Let me hear you say amen out there. All of those who are here for the first time. Everybody else be quiet. All of those who are keeping the Sabbath for the first time, let me hear you say amen. What? May God be with us and draw near today as we keep the Sabbath with him. His day, the Lord's day, a day in which he draws near. You'll forgive me for telling you this, but last night I had a pleasant surprise. My firstborn, my daughter, and her husband came in late last night to be with us today. You can't see them, I don't guess, but they're right down front here somewhere, and I want them to stand up, please. Would you? Yeah, there they are. Thank you. Welcome to this. We thank the Lord for all of his goodness on the Sabbath day. And as we worship him, let's seek the blessing we stand in need of in our hearts. This is his day, so I want to talk about him. And in our scripture, which was read in our hearing this morning, from the book of Ezekiel chapter 33, God spoke to men and women born in sin, Men and women who desire to be saved from sin. And God spoke so tenderly, so earnestly, and with such a caring heart. Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin, if he'll turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked will restore the pledge and give again that he had robbed, Walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. This is the word of the Lord to men and women who are burdened down in sin and covered with iniquity. God said, you will die, but if you hear me say that and you're willing to turn, ye shall surely live and not die. God's talking to real rascals when he says that. Talking to those who feel hopeless, and I've talked to some. He's talking to those who don't see how on earth they can be saved. And I have talked to some. And what God is discussing is not justice, but grace. What God is offering is a miracle. Nothing short of a miracle can turn a rotten, no good sinner into a saint. The Lord says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. All of it. The little ones and the big ones and the ones that have made you feel hopeless, the Lord says, I will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. What a God we serve. A God who inhabits eternity. A God who sits on a throne everlasting. A God who holds the worlds in his hands. A God who has to see to it that a billion worlds fling around in space without collision and catastrophe. And that same God has to look at four billion people on earth and make sure their hearts beat. 
That kind of a God says to you and me in Isaiah 118, Come now, come now. You're beside yourself. Settle down. Come now. Come now. Stop kicking against the pricks and making a fool out of yourself and wasting your eternal destiny. Come now. What you're into doesn't make sense. Come now. Let us reason together. I, the great God, will talk to no good you. Let's talk this thing out. Let's look at it from every conceivable angle. Come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. What? Yes. How much? Free. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But, oh God, I thought of you as a merciless judge. I thought of you as an uncompromising avenger. In fact, I've thought of you as some kind of constable or deputy sheriff. No! No! Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. No! A thousand times no! Can a mother forget her suckling child? Yea, she may forget, yet I'll not forget thee. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Beloved, we've heard people talk about God's love so much that it almost turns us off. But think today. Think for a moment of your estate without Him. Think of what you are and where you're headed without that love. We are born condemned, miserably and wretchedly and hopelessly lost. And God is saying, come now. We can do something about that. We can take your sins away and make you whiter than snow, as pure as the fallen snow. Beloved, you may search this earth from north to south and from east to west. You will never find a man kinder than God. Human beings will forgive you, but they won't forget you. God says the miracle that I'm talking about involves a miracle I have to perform on myself. For an infinite mind cannot forget. God says, I've even numbered the hairs on your heads. And the moment I think of you, I can think of everything about you. I can even think of the exact numbers of hairs on your heads. That's an infinite mind. And yet God says, I will perform a miracle on my own mind. My mind cannot forget. And yet I will do something in my own mind. So that when you confess your sins, I will make myself forget. And when a sinner comes and says, Lord, bury that dirty, evil thing I have done, I will tell that sinner, that's the end of it. Don't you even think of it anymore, because I will not think of it anymore. A man wants to join the church. He's sincere, but he's no good. And the minute he starts moving forward, the people eye him very carefully. Whether he knows it or not, he's on undeclared probation. They're peeping out of the corners of their eyes. They know about him. They know the kind of life he has done. They know the sins he has committed. They know his reputation. And even though he's coming forward in their hearts, they have no confidence in him. They're saying to themselves, let's watch him a while. Let's see if he means it. But God doesn't reason that way. God says, remember that thief on the cross. That man was hanging there, his belly full of foul obscenities, his lips just finished cursing. And yet when his attention was drawn to the cross in the middle, he saw God hanging on that cross. His eyes went wandering over the heads of the mobs across the city skyline. And as he looked around to his left, he saw the city dump, the valley of Hinnon, Gehenna, a place where the fires never went out. Where refuse was hauled and burned. Where the bodies of dead and decaying animals were hurled. A place where the flames cleared up the filth. And when a man died as a malefactor, often they took him down from the cross, dragged him by his heels down the hill, across the brook Kedron, and over to the valley of Gehenna. And then they took him by his armpits and by his ankles, and they would swing him up on top of the fire so that his body could consume away. It could have been that as that thief was contemplating that, the wind picked up the smoke from the city dump with all of its stinging stench, wafted it across dead man's hill, burning his eyes and his nostrils, and it came home to him then. It came home to him, that's where I'm headed, to the city dump. That's all there is in my future. That's all I have to look forward to. Man, I'm dying. Isn't there something better? He 
decided to contemplate the cross in the middle one more time. And when he looked to Jesus, the Holy Ghost came down and broke his heart and he cried out, Lord! And when he said, Lord, he was saying, I'm recognizing you now as the leader. I'm recognizing you now as the director. I'm recognizing you now as the boss. I'm recognizing you now as the one who will take control and direct the life. I don't have much life left. I might be dead in a half hour. I might be dead sooner. But Lord, Jesus said to that thief, I'm telling you today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And God says to the sinner who is doubting this morning, come now, let's reason together. Well, Lord, what you got to tell me? I want to tell you about that thief. I want to tell you that the grace of God is efficacious to save even a thief who is being executed for his crime. If I can save that thief, I'll save you this morning. Are you scared of adultery? Come now. Let us reason together. There is a woman who's going to be in heaven. Her name was Mary. She lived in Magdala. That woman was a no good tramp. In order to save her, had to cast out seven devils. But I saved her. Are you an adulterer this morning? Come now. Let us reason together. There was also a woman caught in the act. She was brought to me. And when all the rest had gone, I looked at her and said, Woman, where are your accusers? And she said, No man, Lord. Then I said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. I condemn adultery, but not thee. Go and sin no more. There's Rahab the harlot. How rotten is your life? This woman was a prostitute. I saved her. Then there was David. King in Israel, sweet singer of psalms. But that man fell into the muck and ruined his life and his reputation. But I saved him. Lord, how can you do it? The devil hears us ask and he shouts up to heaven. Oh God, how can you save people who do that and you don't save me? How in the name of justice can you take David and not take me? God says, devil, we're not talking about justice. We're talking about amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now am found, was blind, but now I see. God says, let's reason together. You don't have to go home lost today. The minute you repent, I will declare it's finished. I will forget your sin. The blood. The blood. The blood. I've been in a land where a man was howling in pain. He had a chain drawn so tightly around his chest, it was biting into his flesh. There he was writhing as he tried to walk down the street. You say to someone, what happened to him? Why does he wear that chain around his chest? And someone says the priest told him to do it. Why did he tell him? He's trying to pay for his sins. He's trying to atone for his own shortcomings. A priest told him that if he would suffer here, he wouldn't have to suffer hereafter. God says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. In that same land, a man is marching down the streets. I've got pictures of all this. He's walking down the streets, and every time he puts his foot down, God squishes out amongst the stitches of his shoes. You say, what's wrong with his feet? He's got cut glass in his shoes. Why is the glass there? The priest told him to do it. It's a way of paying for his sins. In the Philippines, every Easter, they stick fish hooks in their flesh and they walk down the streets with strings drawn tight from these fish hooks. What are they doing? Trying to pay for their sins. In Singapore, they take silver spears and hang them in their flesh and they walk down the street looking like a human porcupine. Listen, this has always been the devil's approach. Righteousness by works. Martin Luther, the great reformer, beat himself in self-flagellation until his own back looked like a raw steak. God says, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, you can't pay for them. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Can the leopard change his spots? Then may ye do good who are accustomed to doing evil. I take sinners as they are. No fish hooks. No glass in the shoes. I take sinners where I find them. No silver spears hung in their hide. I take sinners wherever a sinner. 
sinner wants salvation, he doesn't have to beat himself. The Son of God was beaten for him. He doesn't have to draw his own blood. The Son of God shed blood on Calvary's tree. Come now, let us reason together. If it's in your heart to give up sin, if it's in your heart to stop breaking God's law, if it's in your heart that you're dissatisfied with the way you've lived and now you see a better way and by the grace of God you want to walk in that way, God says, come and talk to me about it. Let us reason together and a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Drop down on your knees wherever you are. If it's inconvenient to get on your knees, just close your eyes. If you're driving your car and you can't close your eyes, just say it out loud. If you're in company and you don't want to disturb anybody, just think it. All you got to do is reach out to God and He comes running after you. For He is desperate to save your soul. But the sinner says, I don't feel saved. Well, if you don't feel saved, that's not God's fault. Salvation is not in feeling, it's in faith. It is a sin to doubt God's word. And God said he would forgive you if you confess your sins in repentance. Ladies and gentlemen, the word of God cannot be broken. The word of God cannot lie. And if you say God has not forgiven you, you are accusing God of not keeping his promise. And the Bible says the fearful and the unbelieving shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Today in Jesus' name, I plead with everybody here, believe God. Trust his word. Lean not to thine own understanding. Believe God even when you don't feel like it. Believe God when appearances are dark. Believe God when it seems the heavens have turned to brass. Believe God when it seems you can't get a prayer through. Believe God when the devil has given you a bad time. Believe God anyhow. Thy faith shall make thee whole. You know, I've seen men buy cars. And six days later or less, they wish they had bought another car. I've seen folk buy houses, and very shortly thereafter, they're sorry for their choice. I've known people to buy suits and dresses, and they know more than wear at one time when they wonder, why did I buy it? I wish I'd bought something else. Ladies are often guilty of buying an expensive hat only to turn against it before they have worn it twice. But I've never seen anybody give his heart to Jesus who regretted it later. Indeed, it gets sweeter as the years go by. On the other hand, I've seen men say no to the Lord until they lay dying. It's the dubious privilege of the preacher to attend the dead and the dying. I've gone to the bedsides of men who steadfastly refused the grace of God. They sat through every appeal. They got mad at every convicting sermon, but they come down to die. And I want to tell you something. When a man comes down to die, when death comes creeping in the room, when the grim reaper is clawing at the skirts of his garment, everybody I've ever seen wants Jesus. I've seen them die in fear. I've seen them die calling on his name. And for many, they simply call too late. You see, there's only one person who's been through that valley and come out the other side. There's only one person who has tasted of the second death. And now is alive forevermore. And that person is Jesus Christ. So when you come down to die. And you get ready to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The only way you'll have no fear is that he is with you. So let us confess to him in faith. Let us believe his promise when he said, I'll hear you and forgive you. There's a story we've told many times. It's a cute little story I learned, but its lesson is so wonderful, I tell it again. It's a story of a little boy and a little girl, his sister, and they lived in a home in the country. And there were ducks in the farmyard. And that little boy was mischievous, and he was always throwing rocks at the ducks. One day, his mother called him in. She said, Johnny, I want to make something clear to you now. She said, you keep throwing those rocks, and you're going to kill a duck. And if you do that, you're going to have to be punished. So before you get into trouble, I want to give you my word. I want you to understand my instructions. 
My instructions are that you must never yield to this temptation again. Don't you ever throw at the ducks again. Do you understand me? Yes, mommy. Now, if you disobey me, after you understand me, I'll have to punish you. And mother doesn't want to do that. So are you clear? Yes, ma'am. Well, Johnny went on out, and for a day or two, he remembered. But then one day, temptation caught up with him. He was out there, and the old ducks were walking, waddle-legged across the barnyard. And he reached down, and he got a stone. And before he even thought about the commandment of his mother, he wound up, and he let go. And this time, unlike other times, he didn't just frighten the ducks, but one of those stones went zinging through the air and caught an old drake at the back of the head. And the duck rolled over, gave a few kicks, and died. It was then that Johnny realized he'd made a mistake. He'd done it. He disobeyed mother. Punishment! So he looked around to see if anybody saw, and thinking nobody saw, he grabbed a duck and hid it under some debris, and then he went walking to the house as though he hadn't done anything, when all of a sudden his little sister came running out. She said, I saw that. You know how these sisters are when you live. I saw that! Oh, Johnny had terror in his heart. He said, Mary, please, please, don't tell mother I'll do anything. Anything. She said, anything? Anything! She said, go get your wagon. He went and got it, and he came around dutifully. Devil will make a slave out of you. Brought that wagon, and she climbed in. She folded her arms, and she said, now pull me. And around and around and up and down the driveway, and every time he'd get tired and slow up, she would give him a minute, and then she'd say, all right, let's go! Pull me! Day after day after day this went on. Johnny was disconsolate. He was unhappy. And he was tired. He was worn out with pulling her. Scared anyway. Finally, Johnny came to himself. He got to thinking why. It'd be better for me to tell mother and take the punishment than to go through this. This could last forever. I might be pulling her on her wedding day. And so Johnny decided he was going home and come clean. He dropped the wagon to him. And he went running in the house as fast as he could go. Tears were beginning to come as he tugged at his mother's apron string. And she turned around. She said, yes, Johnny, what is it? He said, Mother, i got to talk to you. There's nothing you can do that's so rotten you can't talk to him. Would you say amen, Uncle? Now, you can't talk to everybody. And God has said... You ought to go sometimes in your closet and shut the door. And your heavenly Father that heareth in secret. There are some things you ought not tell the preacher. There are some things you ought not tell your wife. There are some things you ought not tell your husband. There are some things you ought not tell anybody except Jesus. Tell it to Jesus alone. Mother dried her hands. She went over and sat down. Then she said, all right, Johnny, what is it? He was really crying now. He said, Mother, I've been disobedient. She said, tell me about it. He said, five or six days ago, I went outside and I remembered that you told me not to throw it to ducks. I don't know what got into me. I really didn't intend to disobey you. But before I realized it, I had reached down and grabbed up a rock and I slung it across the yard and it killed your biggest drake. And he rolled over dead and I tried to revive him but I couldn't. And when he died, I hid him under some debris. Mommy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he was crying so now with his head down he couldn't even see as those beautiful arms of the mother came out and encircled him. And instead of Tanning him good, which he deserved, he felt them drawing him. And she drew him in close to her bosom. And she put her own face against his. And her tears and his tears were mingled together as she whispered in his ear, Johnny, my boy, Johnny, I'm so, so glad you came to tell me. I'm so glad you came to tell me. You see, Johnny, I saw you when you did it. 
looking up from the sink. I saw you when you did it. And I've just been praying for you, John. Just been waiting to hear you come. Just been longing, waiting to see if what we've tried to teach you took effect. And when you came in with tears in your eyes, I knew that you were genuinely repentant, Johnny. And now, because you did that, Mommy's not going to offer any punishment at all. You just go on out now and don't ever disobey again. Boy, Johnny turned. He reached up with his whole arm and wiped his eyes. And then he did the same thing to his nose and he took off outside. As soon as he got outside, there was that sister. She had a frown on her face. Her jaw was tight. And when she saw him coming, she stuck her finger out and said, Where have you been? And before he could answer, he, she jumped in the wagon. And he walked up to her and she said, Pull me! He said, Huh? I said, Pull me? No, sir. I pulled you my last time. She said, if you don't pull me, I'm going to tell mommy what I saw you do five days ago. Johnny said, go on in and tell her. Go on in and tell her. I've already told her. That thing is settled. I don't have to pull you anymore. Devil catch you in the one saying, he'll make a burden bearer out of you. He'll destroy your peace. He'll make you sick and tired of yourself and him and everything else. Still, he won't let you go. But there's one way to cut loose. All you got to do is tell it to Jesus. And the Lord will not scold you. The Lord will not wash your face in it. The Lord will not mercilessly excoriate you. Instead, with loving arms, he'll draw you closer and closer. And he'll say, I saw you when you did it. Go now and sin no more. Thy sins are forgiven me. And still we are afraid. One great preacher wrote a little allegory. He said a man had a child, a boy. And after that boy got to be 10 months old and 11 months old, the father and mother yearned to see him walk on his own. But he wouldn't even try They couldn't get him to walk. Finally, he was so old, he was talking. Still, he had to be carried everywhere, pushed everywhere. Then he got even older. One day, the father decided, that boy is old enough to reason. So he went over to him in his little old carriage, and he said, Son, Mommy and I are trying to figure out why you won't learn to walk. And the boy said, Well, Daddy, I'll, I'll explain that to you. You see, it's like this. I don't believe in rushing into anything. I somehow feel that before I undertake something like that, I'd better make sure of all the angles. Not only that, Daddy, but you know on those days when Mother pushes me out to the park, I see all those other kids trying to walk. They think they're smart. They think they know how to walk. And they start down the walkway, and I'm sitting in my carriage looking at them, and the first thing you know, one of them's fallen and tumbled over right on his nose, banging his head against the cement. And then he gets up bawling. I watch that, Daddy. I all see other I also see other babies who go bumping into benches and light posts and into the shrubbery, and down they go. They think they can walk, and I keep watching them sitting in my carriage. And some of them just get tired of trying. And they just stretch out right on the ground. And their mothers have to pick them up and carry them anyhow. Now, Dad, if there's anything I hate, it's to see people always trying to walk and stumbling all the time. Matter of fact, Daddy, I consider them to be hypocrites, and I can't stand that kind of stuff, so that's why I haven't tried yet. Now, don't misunderstand me, Daddy. I think everybody ought to learn to walk sometimes. I just want to be sure that that, that, that when I start, I can make it. I don't want to be stumbling along and making mistakes. I want to stay in this carriage here until I'm old enough and strong enough and smart enough that when they put me down to walk, I can walk. 
That rascal should be put in an institution. What would you think of a son like that? Talking about he doesn't want to walk until he's sure. And yet there are folks who stand around all the time watching church members. The other night I got this long question, and I'm not condemning anybody because church members ought to live right. But somebody wrote me a note and said, you know, you preach certain things and some of the folks in your church do those very things. Well, I want to tell you something. If there are hypocrites in my church, too. But you don't have to judge them. The Lord's going to take care of them. And they're going to hell if they don't straighten up. Having your name on the church record won't do it. Would you say amen out there? But on the other hand, don't go judging my hypocrites. Some of them are going to straighten up. Some of them are going to get out of that carriage and learn how to walk. What do you say out there? Some of them are going to be touched. It could be in a meeting just like this. Some of them are going to feel the Holy Ghost. Some of them are going to hear God speak to them. Some of them are going to get tired of the devil. And they are tired of pulling him around in their little red wagon. And they are going to Jesus and make their confession. And they are going to be through with the devil forever. While folks stand back watching hypocrites being lost themselves. Those same hypocrites are going to get right with God. This is the miracle of grace. The Lord takes care of your past sins in an instant. That's called justification. But then when he starts sanctifying you, making you holy, making you what you ought to be, fixing you so he can keep you from falling, God has to work with you every day. And in his patience, and in his love, and in his kindness, he will do exactly that. In the book of Hosea, chapter 11 and verse 3, God says, I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by their arms. There is a picture. A father has a child. child's learning to walk. But if that child's like all other children, he is going to stumble. He is going to make some mistakes. He is going to fall and, and hit his head against the floor. But a loving father doesn't just put him out there on his own. He catches him under the arms and holds him up. And those unsteady little feet go padding along. And when the father thinks he's got it down, he lets him go. And the minute that child begins to stagger, that father reaches and gets him again by the arms. You're not walking by yourself. God says he took Ephraim, taught him how to go, taking him by the arms. This morning... God has revealed so much truth to you and to me. This is the accepted time. This is the time to make a decision to do all that the Lord has said. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In Noah's day, there was one place where a man could be saved. And yet the majority of people scoffed at that very thing. They turned to people who were in the valley of decision. And they said to those people, you mean you have to go up to Noah's old boat church? You mean that's what you got to do? Why, look at all these good people out here on the outside. Look at them. They're not going up there. You think all these folk are going to be lost? Why, that is ridiculous. But beloved, you've read the Bible. By and by the Holy Ghost speaks for the last time. And the Bible has already told me that the majority will not do God's will. The Bible's already told me that the crowd is going to hell. The Bible's already told me that men and women in great masses will not do God's will. I already understand that. And on the day the flood began, only those who had stepped across the sill into Noah's ark were saved. And of all people, there were only eight. Now there's something else I want to tell you. When those eight people got on that boat, it didn't always feel good. It didn't always look good. Are you listening to me? When they got on that boat, they were not without temptation. When they got on that boat, it was not all smooth sailing. Are you listening? When those eight people got on that boat, everything did not go as they expected it to go. First of all, the doors were locked. And the rain was coming so hard and so fast, even the windows had to be locked. 
So here they were, shut up in that boat with all the air holes closed and animals stink. Wasn't pleasant in there. Are you listening to me? They had some trials in that ark. They had some problems in there. And when those surging waters began to toss that old ark like a pancake on a griddle, they were bumping from side to side. And I imagine some of them wondered, is this thing really going to do the job? Is this thing really going to land us safe? You mean to tell me that a boat that's being tossed to and fro like this is the only safe place to be? Ladies and gentlemen, it was the only safe place to be. Would you say that? And everything did not always go smoothly. When you come into the church of the living God, it is the devil's job to try to get you back out. It's his job to point your eyes to hypocrites. It's his job to get some unconverted person to mistreat you. It's his job to try to get you to feel sorry for yourself. It's his job to make you dissatisfied with the building you're worshiping in. And if I were the devil, that's exactly what I would do. By the way, what do you expect the devil to do? Pat you on the back and wish you well? Not in your lifetime. It is the devil's job being the devil 24 hours a day, every day of the year. And the devil likes nothing more than attacking Christians, whether they are new or old in Christ. What do you expect? And who do you think you are? Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot went around pleading, even with his own children, come with me. God has told me, tonight he's going to destroy this city. His own children thought he was crazy. Oh, Daddy, you're getting senile. We are not about to leave these fine homes. Why, because of you and because of our family connection, all of us live on the better side of the tracks. Because of you, we are better educated than most. Because of you, we have these terrific jobs. You mean you're telling us to leave this? Oh, Daddy, you're crazy. Finally, the angel said to Lot, linger no more. Escape for thy life. Had to literally drag them out of Sodom. And as he got out there, he heard a thunderous boom. And when he looked around, the city was exploding. Flames were enveloping the city from the outside in, so that no sinner left inside of there could escape. Only three people got out alive. One actually got out and in disobedience turned back. Jesus succinctly put it this way in a verse that's isolated in the New Testament. He said, remember Lot's wife. Don't ever look back when God has advanced you in truth. Don't ever look back when God has led you step by step into His will. Don't ever look back when God opens the door of salvation to you. Don't ever look back house was on fire. Man trapped inside. A fireman risking his own life climbed up high on another building. Carried with him up to that roof a heavy plank. Took that plank and stretched it from the building of safety to the building that was burning. From window sill to window sill. And then at the risk of his own life, he went into those rooms of the burning house combing every dark corner, looking for a soul to save. And he found one man in that house. He said, man, come with me. There's only one way out of here. The man ran behind him until he got to the window. The fireman said, I'm going to lead the way. You just follow me. The fireman crawled out on the plank. And when he was about halfway, he turned and looked back. The man was still standing there. Simon said, man, get on the plank. That house is going to be destroyed in a moment. The roofs are going to crash down. The walls are going to fall down. Get on the plank while there is hope. The 
man stood there and said, But Fireman, I, I've been thinking about this. It's hard for me to make a decision. After all, look at this wonderful house. You mean to tell me that this big house is going to burn and that little old plant is the means of salvation? The fireman said, man, it's the only means of salvation. Get on the plane. But man, if I get up there, I might fall. You don't have any railings on that plane. Now stop and think about it again. Could this great big house be wrong? And that little plank be right? And the broken-hearted fireman stood with tears streaming down his face when with a thunderous crash the seal of a foolish man was done. Oh, beloved, the Lord wants to save us. His grace is sufficient. But he doesn't force anybody to be saved. The Lord is calling for men and women this morning. Doesn't matter what your problem is, the Lord wants us to follow him. If he offers you a plank, take the plank. The Lord's plank is better than the devil's bridge. Whatever the Lord offers, take that. Don't question the Lord. Just know his will and move forward. Can he save us? Can he save us? A miracle of grace. There was a man once who was a leper. Last year on the first Sabbath we preached to you about a leper whose name was Naaman. We told you at that time that leprosy was a disease in Israel which was considered a type of sin. And when a man came down with leprosy in those days, he was ashamed of himself. He was ashamed for people to find out because it was believed in those days that the only reason you got leprosy was because God sent judgment because of your secret sins. And so we'll call this man John. Married to a beautiful woman, let's call her Mary. Several lovely children, good job, high standing in the community. Everything is going his way. When one day, as he's finishing his bath and drying himself off, he notices some white spots on his hand. That's the telltale sign of the incurable disease. And then he gets terrified, and as he looks at it, he decides he won't even tell his wife for a while. He'll just try to cover it up, but he can't sleep, and he can't eat. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And when God is disturbing you, that's a blessing. People who are complacent don't realize they're lost, and folk who don't realize they're lost won't seek Jesus. And so the man, even though he tried to cover it up and keep it from his wife, he watched it spread. And the hair inside the spot began to turn white. He knew exactly what that meant. So he decided, I'd better take my wife in. He went and got a look of himself in the mirror. His cheeks were a little bit puffy. The earlobes looked like they'd been pumped up with air. All across his face... There was this shiny indication that something was dreadfully wrong. So he called his wife away from the children, took her into their private bedroom and closed the door. He said, Mother, I want to tell you something now. I don't want you to be panicky, but I don't think I should keep it from you any longer. Something is dreadfully wrong. He was trying to prepare her. She began to suspect the worst. She said, John, what is it? What is it? He pulled back the long sleeve and revealed those spots. And she gasped in unbelief. She grabbed the hand that she'd loved, the hand that had caressed her so many times. She took it in her hand. She put her eye down close. She saw that the hair was turning white inside the spots. Oh, John, she said, Lord, no. It can't be. It can't be. But when she collected herself, she said, you know the law. You've got to present yourself to the priest. You've got to go to the temple. You've got to come clean with a priest. And so John made his way quickly. This morning he was so nervous he wouldn't even speak to his friends. He didn't want to be waylaid. 
he made a beeline to the temple. And when he got there, the priest had known him for a long time. Oh, Brother John, glad to see you. I was just thinking, what a wonderful church member you have been. Oh, but sir, please, let's not... Oh, but you've been so faithful. We can always count on you. You've got a good name in the community. Everybody looks up to you. I'm thinking about making you a local elder. But sir, I've got a problem. Please don't talk like that anymore. Where can we go and I can talk to you privately? Well, we'll come into my office, John. And they step into the office and he pulls up the sleeve and he shows the man the spot that had just been flattering him. And the priest takes a look. He recognizes it. And now his countenance has changed. He turns and looks into John's eyes and he says, Man, what have you been doing? You, whom I thought I could count on. You, whose name I promoted in the board meeting. You, about whom children love to cluster. You, held up as an example in every broken home in Israel. You, you got leprosy, man. You know what this means. You've fallen into disfavor with God. And from henceforth, John... Thou shalt be a social outcast. You're not to mingle with your people. You can't even go home to your family. You gotta take off and go out into the realm of the dead and there wait for death and pray that it will come. And as you pass through the gate of the temple, don't even put your hand on the gate, lest the gate shall be contaminated. Get yourself a shawl and wear it. And every time you come near somebody else, cover your face, lest your breath give them the disease. And when you hear a rider coming on horseback, and the hoofs of the horse are keeping a lot of noise, you must scream to the top of your voice, unclean, unclean. So that the rider can bolt from your pathway. John, you are consigned to the company of the damned. Not only are you a social outcast, but you are a spiritual outcast. This day, I will recommend to the board that your name be dropped as a deacon. This day, I will recommend to the board that your name be dropped from the church membership. This day, I will spread the word of the kind of man you are that has brought down the retributive judgment of God. Get out of my sight now! A lot of the labor. John goes by home. His wife, suspecting, has wrapped up a few things. She holds it out at arm's length as he takes it. He can't even kiss his wife goodbye. The children are standing there wide-eyed and, wide and confused. He can't even pat them on the head. His heart is so broken, he cries out and shivers out his goodbye. And then he turns toward the wilderness, thinking perhaps this is the last time he can see his family. Or he'll dwell on the periphery of Israel. He'll watch them from afar until the disease is so advanced he must get completely out of sight. And eventually that time comes and John takes that long journey from whence he thinks he'll never return to the camp of the dead. As he goes down into that valley of the cursed, he sees other lepers, the clothes rotting on their bodies. Fingers have fallen away and only stumps remain. Whole hands have dropped off and the flesh is being scraped by the pound. Men moaning out their grief. Men scraping away dead flesh with a stick. Men screaming to God, let me die. And John knows that's where he's headed. Can you imagine the despair as he walks down into the camp? As the story goes, loved ones, some loved ones, would not forget their accursed loved ones. They would prepare little baskets betimes and bring them to the hill overlooking the valley of the dead. And then they would stand there and call and call until that loved one hobbled into view. They would point to the basket and run. John's family didn't forget him. They kept bringing the basket. And John kept wasting away. Finally, his fingers are gone on his left hand. The right hand crusted with sores. A foot is all bound up. And every time he walks, he leaves a little blood in his track. John knows 
that it's creeping up on him now. John has joined those who cry out in their sad dirges for death to come. And death won't come. And he sees the basket. And he retrieves it. A biscuit. A bottle of wine. A little ointment for his sores. Another stick to scrape with. The stench is unbearable. He hopes to die. No hope of eternal salvation. Shut out from his family. Shut out from the temple. Shut out from his friends. Shut out from God. One day, that wife brings a basket. And she calls to the top of her voice, John! John! There seems to be something about her call this day. That's a little different than other days. John is amazed by it, but thinks it's only his imagination. She points to the basket and flees. And when he laboriously reaches it, he reaches down and takes it in his hands. Those stubs clench it. And as he looks down beyond the biscuits and the oil, he sees a note. And on the note, a rumor. John, we've heard tell of something. There's a young preacher up near the lake of Galilee. And they tell me that the blind see when he touches them. And the deaf hear. John, I haven't been, but what do you think? For a moment, hope dances in his heart. But when he turns to walk back into the valley of the dead and the dying, he sees what happens to men ravaged by the first eye. He looks at his own hands, his own body wasting away. And he thinks, oh no, not me. Maybe if we caught someone in time, maybe. But surely the preacher couldn't help me. He couldn't help me. And he goes on back to his scraping stump. And he rakes away the skin and watches another finger fall and prays for death. But then he hears another call. John! And he goes up the hill as fast as he can. The wife has fled. His eyes race after her. And then they catch the basket and another note. John, we heard something else about that preacher. We heard that he cleanses lepers. He straightened out ten of them at one time. And only one went back to thank him. But that one has told the good news, John. He works on lepers. Again, hope springs in his heart. But then he remembers, oh, no, 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 no. The leper he helped is the one they allow to walk around. Not us. We're too far gone. Nothing can help us. And so he went back to his scraping stump and raked at his sores. But on another day, he hears something else in the wife's voice. John! And when he looks, she points to the basket again, and he goes after it. And this time when he looks down, the note has some instructions. The note has a little encouragement. It says, John, this man does things that no other man can do. Why don't you try him, John? Why don't you try him, John? And hope springs in John's heart. He's too embarrassed with himself to tell anybody else. He thinks maybe if he tries to share his secret, he'll only be laughed at. And I want to tell you, when Jesus calls, he doesn't call crowds. He calls you one at a time. Would you say amen, Arte? You can't wait on your husband to keep the Sabbath. You do it, and maybe you'll help your husband to do it. You can't wait on mommy and daddy to do right. You do right, and God will use you to help win them. But he calls us one at a time. One at a time. So John waits for darkness. His heart is pounding in his chest. He's scraped himself up as best he can. He's bound himself up with his rotting clothes to make himself as presentable as he can. He's aware that as he walks, an aura of stench accompanies him. He knows what a mess he's in. He binds his feet in broad leaves and ties them with vines. And then John finds him an old stick that will fit into his gnarled right hand. Tonight, tonight, I'm going to head north. I'm going to find that preacher. Tonight I shall go. I'm going to start early because I have to travel slow. But I'm going tonight. And when darkness covers the valley of the dead, while others 
Lay down and try. Lie down and try to fall asleep. John begins wending his way quietly toward the ramp that leads out of that hell. And when he reaches the top and feels the refreshing breezes for the first time in a long time, he keeps saying in his heart, Oh God, let it be so. Oh God, let it be so. He toils all night long, but he's headed toward Jesus. Coming home. He leaves blood in every track. And every time he passes a thorn bush, he leaves flesh stuck on the briars. But he keeps on going. The dew is heavy and gets into his aggravated sores. He's stinging. He's wretched. He's a mess. But I will not turn back. I'm going to see what the preacher can do for me. And when the morning sun breaks, John is mounting the crest of a hill. And off in the distance, shimmering peacefully, is the Sea of Galilee. And when he looks toward the shore, he sees a man sitting on a stone. And thousands are gathered around him. John pauses for a moment. Oh, I don't know. Look at all those folks. I got no right to be amongst them. Look at all those folks. They're too good for my company. Look at all those folks. They won't like it if I come into them. Look at all those folks. And he stands there looking at the folks when a little voice seems to say, Man, you're dying. You're dying. Forget about the folks and press on to the preacher. John decides he's going to chance it now. I've come this far by faith, and I will not turn back. And so he starts down the slope. And as he approaches the periphery of the crowd, the people are so intent on what the Lord has to say, that there's only one person in the whole crowd that sees this leper come. And that person is the preacher himself. And John gets closer to the crowd. Folk begin to wonder, what is that? They begin to take their noses. They look around. And when they finally spot him with contempt, they dash out of the way. And John begins his chant, unclean, unclean. I am unclean. I'm sorry, folks. I'm unclean. And as they hear what he has to say, involuntarily they spring out of his way, clearing a path to the preacher. John presses on. Some of them are talking behind his back. Some of them are eyeing him with contempt. Some are criticizing him out loud. Some are talking about what he used to be. Some are saying, I remember when. Some are saying, even then, I knew there was nothing to him. But John has made up his mind. If he is turned down and consigned to hell, it will be the Lord and nobody else that condemns him. He had heard somewhere that God sees not as man sees. He kept pressing on. Everybody is running from him except Jesus. When he is right in front of him, John is still yelling, unclean, to the top of his voice, unclean, as though to frighten Jesus away. But instead, Christ looks at him with those kind eyes. Christ looks at him with a smile on his face. Christ looks at him with mercy and compassion, Beaming out of his countenance. And Christ said to him, What do you want me to do? And John heard a kind voice. An encouraging voice. John heard a voice of peace. John heard a voice without condemnation. John heard a voice that caused hope to spring eternal. John heard the voice of one who has authority over matters celestial and terrestrial. He heard the voice of one before whom devils cringe. He heard the voice of one before him death flees. He heard the voice of one who can command leprosy. What will you have me to do? And before he lost faith, he blurted it out, Lord You can make me whole. And immediately he threw himself on the ground at the feet of Jesus. Burying his eyes in his hands. Ashamed to even look. Hoping 
hoping it's not too late for him. And then he felt what he hadn't felt in years. He felt a human touch. How he had yearned for a compassionate touch. How he had dreamed about the tender hands of his wife. How he had thought about those small, playful hands of his children. He had not felt a hand on him in years. But suddenly it breaks upon his darkened mind, this preacher is touching me. Jesus always touches. He didn't have to do that. One day he stepped out on nothing and he shouted to nothing and he said, let there be light and there was light. Let there be birds and fishes and suddenly the air was split with the murmur of their wings and the seas swished with their fins. He didn't have to touch it. All he had to do was speak. But Christ, before that great audience, touches. And when he tightened his grip on the shoulders of the leper, rottening flesh oozed between his fingers. But Christ did not draw back in revulsion. He tightened his grip, and suddenly John felt the power lifting him. Get up off the ground. Stand on your feet like a man. Thy faith has made thee whole. And like electricity running up and down his spine, he felt it. Vitality coming into dead limbs and dead nerves. John felt it. And as he watched, as he looked, as he rejoiced, suddenly fingers started sprouting on his head. His feet shrank and the vines fell away. The blood and scabs dropped off in clusters at his feet. I'm whole. I'm whole. After worshiping God, he turned and headed home. Now I want you to remember, he hadn't been home for a long time. John had longed to go home. He's running so fast that as he goes by the river, he realizes, I ought to take a bath before I go home. He took time to jump in and splash around and wash off all the residue and do a little bit for those clothes he'd been wearing. And then out of it and heading home as fast as he could go. And when he climbed over the last hill, he started screaming, Mary! Mary! As loudly as he could call, Mary! And inside, that woman bent down with a load of calves. That woman burdened with those children. That woman who had to be mother and father. That woman who had to be housekeeper and breadwinner. That woman whose very fingers now are gnarled with toil and her face lathered with care. That woman was bent over a burden when she heard that voice born on the wind. Mary! Mary! And she shouted to the children, That sounds like John's voice. That sounds like John. She ran to the door in time to see him running home like a 16-year-old boy. He's coming for all his worth. She starts out to meet him, the children trailing behind. A miracle, a miracle. John, where have you been? Where have you been? Mary, bless your heart, I've been to Jesus. That's the miracle. That's what he'll do today. As you came into this auditorium, you were given a piece of paper. I want you now, every one of you, to put your name on there and your address on there. And I want you, after you do that, I want you to do something for me and then pass those papers in. So right now, do that for me. Your name and address on that piece of paper. Then I want you to do this. If today, as you keep God's holy Sabbath, you've heard His voice, you want to do His will. If today, you plan to make that full surrender to Him, 
and in the future walk with Him all the way in full obedience by His grace, I want you to put a big X on your paper. That's all. That's all. And we will be praying for you. Your decision is to follow Jesus, to do what Jesus has said. And by faith, you will claim His miracle. By faith, your leprosy will be cleansed. By faith, you will belong to the family of God. Do that now. And as soon as you've done it, pass those papers to the aisles. And our ushers will continue collecting them. I'm going to have prayer now that God will lead you into this decision this morning. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth as it is in Jesus. We thank you, dear Lord, that you've made your way plain. We thank you, dear Lord, that without thee we are nothing, and yet with thee all things are possible. It is mercy and grace, nothing short of a divine miracle, that has called us from darkness into this marvelous light. Oh, blessed God, give us the strength and the power not to turn back. Give us the grace to make a decision right now. We're going to do what Jesus says. We're going to follow Jesus. We're going to keep His commandments. We're going to become members of His remnant church. We're going to get ready for the coming of our Lord. And we're going to live so that others will see our good works. We're going to live so that others will behold our witness. We're going to live so that we'll have somebody else to bring to Jesus ere probation closes. Oh, dear Lord, bless us today with the faith to accept this promise of salvation. Draw very near. Let us not respond with fear. Let us not respond, oh Lord, under duress or pressure. But let us respond in faith and because we love thee so. Please, Lord, we thank you for hearing us because we've come in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and for his sake. And we ask these things in the name of him who wants to save us more than we want to be saved. In the name of him for whom there is nothing too hard, no case too difficult, we come bringing ourselves just as we are and offering ourselves today, begging for mercy and salvation today. For Jesus' sake, let everyone say, Amen. Please pass those papers in now. Pass them in right now, please, everybody. We'll keep a record of attendance today. And for those who put the X's on the cards, we will be praying for you. In fact, we're going to have special prayer before we leave this building. We're getting out early now. This evening, we'll be back at the regular evening hour. The service will begin at 7.30. We want you in your places for tonight. We're going to hear the message, the question even God cannot answer. We're praying for you. Send those papers to the aisles in the balcony and down here. All of you do it, please, now. We're going to be dismissed as the choir sings then a song that I asked for. His truth is marching on. It's called the Battle Hymn of the Republic. I want them to prepare right now to bring that song. And as soon as the ushers have finished that... We are going to be dismissed, and we can hear this powerful music as we go out of the auditorium. Oh, may God bless you. I hope you've made the right decision. If you decided to obey God, that's the right one. You don't have to worry about what you've done. You don't have to worry about how rotten you are. If you have made that decision today, it is honored even in the courts of glory. May God bless every one of you now as we are preparing to be dismissed from this place this morning. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, please call toll-free... 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. 
There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon. <laughs> 